Welcome to Profiles in Quality, an interview program with the leading names in quality management. I'm your host, Dirk Ducharme. Last week, we began the first of several interviews with quality management guru, H. James Harrington, CEO of the Harrington Institute. At nearly 80 years old, Harrington still spends about nine months out of the year traveling the world to share his expertise on quality management. This gives Harrington a view on quality in other countries that might surprise you, for better or worse. Last week, he spoke on quality in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. This week, Harrington gives us some insight into quality in China, and what he says might surprise you. So let's say in, in regards to China then, you wouldn't agree with a lot of the, the hubbub over the United States doing business with China and you know child labor and uh, low wages, that type of thing. You would just say that's part of that, is part of that culture and that's going to change? You know, I think it's part of the evolution. Okay. You know, it's, just, it's just that they're, they're behind us in, in evolution. Okay. And it, it, the economy that they're working with is a different economy than we have. And you've got to wait for that economy to catch up. You can't drive it. Right. Now, what, what about the what about um, quality issues? You're doing some you're doing some work in China. Um, do you see an effort uh, on the Chinese part to to actively pursue uh, quality and to improve the quality? Obviously, there's been a lot of high-profile quality gaffes. Uh, when I see that the, if we're looking at the percentage of the product that's coming in from China and the number of problems they have is really not out of line with what we're getting from Europe. You know, they still make the best toys in the world. Sure. There's no, you know, Mattel, any of the companies will, will tell you that. They make the best uh, shoes in the world. You know, they, they're making the best clothes in the world. You know, their quality is uh, is is better than we can get any place else. And it, it's not just a matter of cost, it's a matter of quality. I helped Reebok move out of South Korea into mainland China. And it wasn't because of the difference in cost. There's only 50 cents a pair different in cost. But it was the fact that the Reebok shoes made in South Korea, uh, return rate was 1.6% per year. And the ones made in China was 0.4. I started working with them in the early 80s, and I've been the official advisor of the Chinese government and on quality since then. And uh, there's a university there, and they, uh, the University of Buffalo put on f all summer for them a MBA program. And so these 80 CEOs all come together, and they all went through the same MBA program. And I had them for two weeks on that program where I taught them quality. And so, you know, take five times 80, 400 of the top CEOs all learned exactly the same tools, exactly the same techniques. You know, they understood what poor quality cost was and how to calculate it. And they all talked the same language. And you see the advantage, the, the thought advantage that they had when they brought all of them together and, and get a, a single management style for 400 companies. 400 of the biggest companies. And, and yeah. that's the sort of things that they, they did that was amazing to me. You know, there's been a lot of high profile examples of bad quality coming out of China, right, in, in the last few months. There was the, uh, the lead paint in toys from Mattel, and of course there were the, the tainted drugs that killed several children in, in China. How would, how would you address that in terms of quality coming out of China? They felt that they knew that the Minister of Trade knew that that was going on and it was a bad thing to do. Okay. So what'd they do? They shot him. They shot the Minister of Trade. Right. That, that's a rugged way to deal with poor quality. <laughs> no, it means that they're serious about it, right? Yeah. Now yeah. they're not doing that now. Yeah. And that was well one instant, but you know, yeah. it's the whole idea that it's a serious thing. It, it's their economy, and it's very important to them. And they feel that if you put out poor quality, you're cheating somebody. That's right. There was that one, uh, that one toy manufacturer for Mattel who actually committed suicide. They're very serious about it. You know, there isn't a, their economy is based upon that they can produce product that is very high quality. And if you look at what happened, it was an interesting thing. Back when I first started working with them, back in you know, 82, uh, they were saying, well, what should we do? How should, what should our marketing strategy be? Japan was the model. Japan right then, you know, that was at the height. Uh, they were producing much higher quality products than the United States was. 
that we should be following the Japanese model. What's the Japanese model was was brand recognition, you know, the Toyotas, the sure. Sonys. Uh, and in discussing that and uh, going through it, the, they quickly came up with the idea that what they needed was infrastructure right now, and they needed hard cash so they could do infrastructure. They didn't have the American government there to give them the money to do the infrastructure that Japan had after the war. So they had to get hard cash really quickly. And when you start building brand name, you know, that's 10, 12 years. So instead, they took on a different approach. They said, what we're going to do is we're going to go after industry recognition. And they looked at what are the industries they should go after. They said, well, uh, toy manufacturing is a good one because there's only eight customers. Not, <laughs> right. not billions of customers that I got to sell to. I got eight customers, Mattel, you know, the, these key things. So what they actually did is they homed in on the toy industry. They tried to sell not, they don't sell their brand name. They went to the, uh, the major distributors, sold into the major distributors, and that's how they captured the toy market. The next thing they set priority on was the athletic shoes. And of course, they own the athletic shoe market now. Uh, the, the Reeboks, the, the Nikes, everything is built there. But now it's interesting because about two years ago, they looked at it and they said, okay, now we've got enough money. We got the infrastructure money. Now what we need to do is to change our thought pattern. And now what they're doing is they're going after brand recognition, and they've selected a whole series of brands, and they've assigned them to different uh, different parts of the country. And now they're going after brand recognition. And in the next 10 years, you'll start to see uh, Chinese brand names appearing all over the world. It's interesting to listen to Jim Harrington's perspective on quality in China, as well as wages in China. It certainly isn't a perspective that we hear much about in the United States. But whether you agree or disagree with Harrington, let us know. You can contact us at videos at qualitydigest.com or start a discussion on this video by clicking the add comment link beneath your video player. Next week, Harrington talks about quality and family life. More specifically, is the quality of your family life a predictor of how you treat quality in your business life? That's next week on Profiles in Quality.